All right, geographers, let's talk atmosphere now. And you can, I don't know if you can hear in the background, it's a particularly windy evening uh, here at the, uh, in the beautiful Antelope Valley. When I'm recording this, you may hear that ambient uh, noise in the background. Perfect for what we're going to be discussing, because in part we'll get into winds and how wind works and why we have them. And I'm also, I will talk like global wind stuff. Um, but we'll also look at why the Antelope Valley is so windy, right? Because it's, again, we're, we're doing this stuff. Yeah, we're getting into the science stuff. So you guys have a decent physical science background, but we're also going to talk about stuff that's relevant to your everyday lives and just re relevant as being, you know, the desert people that you are. So we'll get into that. Like this, uh, this image here, I'm sure you recognize it. It's the uh, northern end of AVC's campus. Actually, maybe you don't. Maybe it's been a while since you've uh, been there, but still, that's, that's where it is. I think, I want to say this was back in like 2013 when the sky was just this beautiful shade of brown and it was a particularly windy, miserable day. Uh, and that was just, you know, that's just desert there. That's why it was so brown. Sand and dust and, and all this stuff up in the air. And I, I remember it well because it was finals week uh, when it happened. It was in the spring semester in the very last week. I uh, had students who actually, they, they were in my lab class. Their final involved them going outside Look, a final's a final. I'm not going to change just because it's a little windy uh, out. So, yeah, I sent them out into this incredible tornado-like environment, and it was great. I didn't go out. I watched from the lab, all the windows in my lab, and it was hilarious. They would come back, and they had these sandy tears and all that. Very difficult, I guess, for them to work out there. Um, but, you know, that's just that's the AV, right? That's how this place is. Uh, and so we'll get into why that is, why we have these... Ridiculous winds. But before we get into that, we're going to get into what the atmosphere is all about, what it does, why it's important, and then that'll lead into a very brief weather discussion. And if you're at all interested in this stuff, we offer Geography 102, our weather and climate class that, uh, well, as far as I'm going, unfortunately, it's, it's more weather than it is climate, but if you take it with me, I try to get more of the, the climate stuff in there as well, but you'll learn all this stuff in detail, all right? So you get a little introduction here, but if this is, if you're really into this stuff, I know some people, they're weather people, bless your little hearts. Uh, so that's the case, Geography 102 will go way more into in depth into this stuff. All right, so the atmosphere, when we're talking about it, it's, it's the air, right? It's the stuff we're breathing in, it's the air around us. Um, but it's more than just this oxygen that we are breathing into our bodies. It's actually, it's a mixture of gases. We'll talk about that. It also, it's doing a lot of work, right? One of the, the key things is it's filtering out some of that incoming solar radiation. So if you recall back, I think I, I, this was like the, the seasons thing that I was talking about. Uh, a little while ago, uh, the sun, this radiant energy that's coming from the sun, it's not all sunlight, right? It's not sunshine and all that. There's other stuff. And and some of the these radiant waves that are coming at us, it's actually pretty nasty stuff. And we would not be able to exist here on this planet if we didn't have the atmosphere doing what the atmosphere does, right? So it's incredibly important. And that's because it's not simply oxygen. Uh, there's other stuff, other gases up there that are doing, doing some good work, keeping us nice and safe. But honestly, what I think is, is kind of cool about the atmosphere and, and like in the study of the atmosphere and discoveries and things like that, what's cool is that it's, it's invisible. It's kind of hard. We don't really think about it, right? Like, honestly, before, you know, you started listening to this lecture, before you saw the title that said the atmosphere and all that, were you really thinking about 
the atmosphere. Typically, we don't, right? Unless we have something like the god-awful windstorms and dust storms that are blowing all over the place. And we can see it when something's wrong with the atmosphere, when it's polluted in some way, then we might think about it. But it's it's invisible. We don't really feel it or see it or experience it, or at least we do, but we don't pay attention to that, right? And I think with some of that, uh, it goes to explain why it took a while for us to really get a sense of what's going on, right? Like oxygen itself, something fundamental to life, wasn't discovered until the uh, 1700s, right? Until the, the 18th century. And it's actually two folks claim credit. We're going to talk about this guy, Joseph Priestley, uh, mainly because he's crazy, as we'll, we'll get into. Uh, and he's effectively, he's an American, right? I mean, you look at the date, 1774, there weren't really Americans in that sense, but, you know, he, he hung with our, our people uh, at the time over in the colonies when he could, so we can claim him, right? Better than some other French guy. So we're going to go with Priestley. And to be honest, I don't really pay attention to, um, you know, this kind of stuff ever. And like, you know, it's, it's kind of like, ooh, discovering air. Um, doesn't sound that great. Uh, but I got sent this book. And it's called The Invention of Air by Stephen Johnson. And it was uh, very boring sounding, right? It was like a, a publisher sent it to, to take a look. And it was like, okay, whatever, free book. Um, but it was fantastic. Uh, and, and mainly because it's not all about, you know, discovering air. He goes off into different um, aspects of it and, and all that. But it was also just kind of cool, simply because Priestley, he, he was a moron, um, as best I can tell. That's what I took from reading this stuff, right? And this is a great thing. Like right now, as I'm recording this, um, statues are being pulled down around the country of of men who were you know held up as heroes but maybe not the greatest individuals you already know how i feel about columbus we we discussed uh columbus before and some of these other folks but you realize and Priestley, as far as i could tell he wasn't like an evil guy um you know he wasn't slaughtering indians or, or anything like that as far as i can tell i you know, I, I would research a little more before I decided whether to put a statue up for the guy or whatever. Um, but what we're learning is that some of these historical figures that we hold up and try to make, you know, and we say like, oh, aren't they incredible? Actually, it turns out a lot of them were morons. Uh, and it was a lot of PR to, to give them all this credit uh, and all this stuff. This cat was crazy. Um, and here's, I mean, and, and Johnson himself in describing... Uh, Priestley uh, goes to show. I mean, he's, I say he's a moron, but he's he's lovable too. At the same time, one of those lovable morons, you know the type. Uh, and Johnson describes him in his book, uh, saying he was a hacker, not a theoretician, right? Meaning that you know all that stuff I talked to you about when we were getting into science and the scientific method and all that. And I was saying like, you know, you have to have. You know, the method, and the, it's got to be verifiable and repeatable, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, Priestley didn't do that. He didn't have time for that. He just liked to play around, right? This hacker idea. He would just goof off, and if something worked, it worked. Fantastic, right? Now, one thing that Priestley loved to do was to make glass stuff, right? Little, you know, beakers and flasks and that. I mean, I'm, I'm no chemist, um clearly, based on how I talk about them. Uh, but if you've taken a chemistry class or met a chemist or whatever, you know they take their glassware seriously, right? They, oh, you can't use this beaker or this flash or whatever. Or, like, they're really into it. And a big part of that seems to be from guys like Priestley, who he would just make these different glass vessels and things. Uh, and I, I believe some of them are still used today. His invention, inventions here, so he, they... Take this stuff really seriously, okay? So he likes to mess around with glass and create these different things, these, again, these vessels for, you know, whatever, chemicals, whatever. And so he's hanging out in his lab workshop, whatever the guy's got, and he's got he's got a glass jar, okay, with a lid, uh, and he's got a mouse, okay? And so he decides 
to take this, it's a living mouse, he takes the mouse, puts it in the jar, seals it up. Wh what do you think happens? What is your hypothesis, my little scientist? Yeah, the, the mouse dies. Um, if it's not clear, sorry, spoiler, I should have said pause and, and think about it. No, the mouse dies, right? Runs out of air, we get that. Uh, so the mouse dies, and he, he opens up the jar, dumps the mouse out, gets another mouse. Uh, he's got like a bucket full of mice. I don't know. Uh, I can't remember fully. Um, you know, I read it a long time ago. But anyway, he's got, he gets another mouse, puts it in the jar, seals it up. What happens? Yeah, it dies. It, it dies again. So he dumps that one out, and then he puts another one in the jar. Like, he kills like 20 mice. I don't, I don't know what he's doing. He's just throwing mice in here, just having fun murdering mice. And so he kills like 20 of them, and then he gets another mouse. Puts it in the jar, but he says, no, you know, this is getting kind of dull. I'm going to mix it up. So he puts a plant in there with the mouse. I believe it was a sprig of mint or, or something along those lines. Uh, and he puts the, the little mint plant in with the mouse, and he seals it up. And what do you think happens? Does anything change? What do you think? Uh, you, right now, you're, you're, you're processing, you're, hopefully, you're shouting into your computer, or your phone or whatever you're saying uh you, you know yeah the mouse it, it lives uh and it and it doesn't it, i'm sorry but it lives longer it doesn't die as quickly it still dies things still doesn't fully make it um but it but it, it has a longer jar life and why is that all right we learned this early on so animals like the mouse or like us all right we breathe in oxygen which is o2 two molecule or two atoms of oxygen make up the the uh the molecules we're breathing in right we breathe out co2 carbon dioxide so that exits our body and plants they're breathing in co2 and they're breathing out the o2 and so that's that works right fantastic we know that because we already know that we're, you know, we're using this deductive reasoning to explain what's going on with the mouse that has the plant in there, right? But that general knowledge doesn't exist yet. And so Priestley is sitting there, and that mouse won't die. And he's looking at it like, come on, mouse, what's, what's going on? And then eventually the mouse dies, and he's like, son of a gun, what's the deal? Still can't figure it out. That's what I love about this guy. Still can't get it. So he writes a letter to his friend, these buddies with Ben Franklin. I don't know if you heard of the guy. Um, and actually what's really great is that Franklin's the one who seems to be really doing the hard work in trying to explain. Like he's trying to tell Joe Priestley here. He's, he's saying like, Joe, you know, you got something here. Um, Franklin doesn't need the cred, right? Because he's inventing electricity and freedom uh, and, you know, and all this stuff uh, that he did. So this is actually Franklin's words here. He's writing to Joseph Priestley that the vegetable creation should restore the air which is spoiled by the animal part of it, looks like a rational system, and seems to be a piece of the rest. It's so Ben Franklin-y, isn't it? That's just, that's how people used to talk. Uh, you go back a few centuries. But so it's that idea, you know, the vegetable creation plants restore the air which is spoiled by the animal part of it right it's getting into that they don't know that it's o2 and co2 and, and this kind of stuff but it's you know we humans we breathe in stuff we breathe out bad stuff and the the plants are like our filters or whatever they figure that out they piece it together okay and honestly what they're getting they're not even fully understanding the atmosphere they just figure out here that huh Son of a gun, there, there's something here that we actually need to breathe, and if we're stuck in a jar, we don't get to breathe. Like, this isn't that groundbreaking, you know, when we think about it today, but this, nobody had done this up until this point in human history, which is amazing. Uh, just, just to think about how little we knew. So Priestley, fantastic mouse murder, fantastic uh, guy, clearly. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting book. I recommend it. Um, you know, if you get a free copy, uh, or whatever. Uh, and what the book, what Johnson is getting into in this, it's not just about killing mice. Uh, he's also, he's, he's discussing a 
bigger concept of networking and how discovery takes place and all that. And really, so what he's arguing for with this, this book is the grander idea that no one person invents anything by themselves, right? And that we could extend this further. Like, this is a moment in time as statues are getting ripped down. It's not a good moment in time to remind ourselves of this, that there's no one human that does anything. Everybody's always working together. And so, you know, in this case, scientific discovery, but, you know, innovation in general, or just ideas or important moments and changes and stuff like that in history, it all comes from multiple people working together, communicating, discussing things and, and all of that. That's the, uh, uh, that's the idea here. So like the, the case in point is that Priestley, yeah, he's killing the mice, but if he's not talking to his buddy Ben Franklin, he doesn't figure this out, right? So we give Priestley the credit, and there are, you know, Joseph Priestley is held up, I guess, in chemist circles um, as this important figure. But when you read about, like, what he did, it's kind of like, good lord. Um, but yeah, it's clearly, it was, you know, he's held up as an important figure today, but he was working with some other folks, and it was this discussion that was taking place. And I think for anyone starting out in college, you know, whatever it is, you're, you don't have to be, you know, wanting to go into the physical sciences for this to be relevant. I think it's just nice to hear that, you know, all these individuals that we learn about and we hear about and, and all that. Yeah, some of them, I mean, sure, they were smart, um, you know, or, or clever, or, you know, whatever. But nobody does this by them cells, right? For me, I know it was daunting. When I was starting, I was kind of like, God, how, you know, how am I ever going to do anything smart and and have any, you know, meaningful impact on the world or anything like that? I mean, look at all these brilliant, brilliant people. And then you learn more and you realize, oh, yeah, that, okay, they weren't so that brilliant to begin with. And some of it was luck uh, and some of it was just you know, this networking stuff, and also PR goes along with, you know, all that, that kind of stuff. So just remember that. Nobody works alone with this stuff. So even if I point out, you know, important individuals, they weren't by themselves. There were other folks helping them out. And so we're at a moment in time where we're, we're trying to find these stories. We're trying to get the stories of the people who were helping others out. And we're still figuring it out, and we could still do better. I know I'm, I'm talking about a lot of, you know, dead white guys uh, in, in this stuff, but clearly there are other individuals, folks who don't necessarily meet that dead white guy criteria, who are, are really, you know, important here. Now that said, uh, I'm going to talk about a few other dead white guys um, in a moment. Sorry, hey, I'm, I'm trying. Um, I, I'm baby stepping. All right, so that's that's the idea. But now let's get into, like, okay, great, we got oxygen. But since Priestley and Franklin and these guys are working together to figure this stuff out, we've since learned a lot about the greater atmosphere, that it's not simply oxygen and CO2. There's a lot of stuff going on. We also know that the atmosphere that we are, are in today is not the same one that's been here since day one. We've actually seen different atmospheres here on this planet. We're in the fourth of general atmosphere at this moment in time. And the, the one we're, we're breathing in right now, it's about 500 million years old. All right? And that's something we kind of take for granted. But it's, it's kind of good to think about. It. And it makes sense. Like everything else we know about the planet, it was a radically different place as you go back in time, but honestly, if you had some kind of time machine and you could go back and you went back like a billion years, you couldn't exist on this planet. It, you would die, right? Because you wouldn't have air to breathe, as well as, you know, a whole host of other things. So, you know, the atmosphere, for being this invisible thing that we ignore all the time, it's so important because without it, we can't exist. Right? And our bodies have evolved in this specific atmosphere. And so that's why it's a perfect habitat for us right now, at this moment in time. But it, again, it hasn't always 
been like that. And we've had life on this planet that has existed in very different atmospheres. In fact, some of the earliest life on the planet was uh, uh, the, these anaerobic microbes. It's like the bacteria we have on the left of the screen here. Um, anaerobic meaning it's not breathing in oxygen. I forget exactly what it was that it required. But it was the idea that during the atmosphere at this moment in time or in the atmosphere there, really no oxygen at all. And then because of different tectonic shifts and other changes in the planet, we have oxygen come flooding in to the atmosphere. And we have this mass extinction where trillions of these bacteria are wiped out because there's too much oxygen. They can't breathe. They suffocate because there's oxygen in the atmosphere now, right? It's just kind of crazy to think about. But then, also when this oxygen comes in, there's more oxygen then than there is today, right? So there's a higher concentration of oxygen in the greater atmospheric makeup. I don't know, do you guys, listening to this, hey, hey student, um, did you have when you were growing up, did you have dinosaur books? Did, oh, I hope you did. Because, I mean, that's, that's an important part of any childhood. Uh, right now, my youngest boy, he's, he's four. Um, yeah, he's got, you know, some dinosaur books and the dinosaur toys. We make them fight uh, all the time. It's fantastic. But what's crazy about these dinosaur books that I've noticed is that all of them, they always have like a giant dragonfly just in there. Right? It's never the main thing. You want to see the Tyrannosaurus Rex or, or whatever. That's the that's the dinosaur you want to see. But then you got this big dragonfly just hovering in the background. And we kind of take it for granted. But yeah, it turns out there's some big dragonflies if you go back in time. Uh, and we have dragonflies today that clearly aren't that big. Like you see this one, this example in the image with that two-foot wingspan. No, we don't have those flying around today. And that's because we had so much oxygen in the atmosphere in the time of these ridiculous large dragonflies so that their bodies were able to be this big. Their exoskeletons and all that, they had enough support with the extra oxygen in the atmosphere so that they could, in fact, exist. Today, we have a lot less oxygen in the atmosphere, and therefore we got tiny little bugs because that's that's what our atmosphere allows. Does that make sense? So it's the idea that as oxygen levels decreased, our insects got smaller, right? Because of the, the gases and all that. And then we'll get into air pressure and, and all of this stuff uh, in a moment. But it, it could not support. Like if you did like a Jurassic Park thing where you got some of this giant dragonfly DNA. Oh, if you get it, don't do it. Uh, it would just be sad because the thing couldn't fly. Around, like it would kind of flap around and say like, kill me. And then and then we'd just die. Um, it would be cruel. Don't clone the giant dragonflies because our atmosphere can't hold them up. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad we discussed that. So this is what uh, our atmosphere looks like right now. Okay. So it's, as I said, it's a mixture of gases, oxygen, which is, you know, so important for us to, uh, you know, breathe in and live. It's about 20% of the atmosphere, right? About a fifth of the entire uh, atmosphere itself. Most of the atmosphere is nitrogen, okay? So that's, you know, 78-ish percent right there. And then what this leaves is a tiny little sliver of these other gases. Argon we're not going to worry about and deal with, um, but carbon dioxide, I do want to point this out here, so this 0.035%. I bring this up because, of course, we'll be talking about it when we get into the greenhouse effect, global warming, climate change, all that good stuff that we're going to be covering in, you know, future lectures. And so with carbon dioxide, it's a greenhouse gas, and I'll explain what that is later on when we, we get to that stuff. Um, but, but we, we talk about it quite a bunch, uh, and we were discussing how we're putting all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's causing temperatures to go up. Again, I'm going to get into the mechanics of this stuff. Uh, and then you have some people who say, look, that's ridiculous. 
the atmosphere is big, the Earth is big. How could we possibly affect the Earth's atmosphere, right? Like we're just too tiny and insignificant. No, that's not the case when we look at the actual breakdown. When you see how little carbon dioxide we have in this greater atmosphere, you realize it's already starting out with this tiny amount, right? And we'll, I'll get into, again, how these greenhouse gases work and all that. But when you see how little CO2 is already there, naturally speaking, it actually starts to make sense to think that, oh, yeah, since the Industrial Revolution, we have uh, we put a lot of this stuff up into the atmosphere. Um, yeah, it, it's we, there's none of this like, oh, the Earth is big. How can we hurt it? No, we can do it. We're pretty impressive. Way to go, humans. Uh, if it were something like, you know, nitrogen had some issue, we're putting more nitrogen into the atmosphere or whatever, then maybe, right? If it's already like 80% of that stuff is in the atmosphere, maybe you got a point. But with the CO2, it's a tiny little amount that is there. And it's it's important to have it there. It's not something we want to get down to zero. Well, again, when I get into the greenhouse effect, I'll get into why. But just keep that number in mind as I start talking about and you start reading about the effects of these greenhouse gases on the Earth's climate. All right, now let's get into air pressure or atmospheric pressure. And it's the idea, like we have to remember that even though it's invisible, we don't pay attention to it. Like there, there's actual stuff, these gases around us things that I'm you know, waving my arms through as I'm, I'm saying this stuff here, it's there, right? And there's actual, it's matter. Like there, there are oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules and all that stuff. And therefore this stuff has weight, right? It's being pulled to the earth, okay? Gravity is pulling it down toward the center of the earth. So it has this weight. We don't pay attention to it because we're born into it and our bodies are able to push back out and effectively, you know, carry and move through the atmosphere. So we don't ever pay attention to it, but it is there and we can measure it and record it. Now this image, but it's showing these ISO lines, which means it's a generic term for lines that connect the same value, right? This is showing actual air pressure right here. We measure it in these millibars. Don't worry about that. I'm just explaining what this is. So like right here, this circle right here around Oklahoma, that's, uh, you know, 1,020 millibars right there. And everywhere this line touches is equal to 1,020, right? And this one right here is 1,024. And this one right here is 1,028, right? That's how we read that. Now what this is showing is actually a pressure gradient and wind We'll get into that in a little bit. So air pressure is going to play a role in uh, winds. But before we get into that, I don't want to, that's like kind of what's happening on the surface or in this kind of horizontal fashion. Uh, I want to talk about what's happening when you go up into the atmosphere and out toward space, right? So as we move from the surface of the Earth up toward outer space, we're going to have a decrease in air pressure, okay? And so what this is showing, I think this helps, uh, helps us envision what's happening, but we've got these different molecules. So the blue be nitrogen molecules, the red oxygen molecules. Down closer to the Earth's surface, we got more of these things, right? Uh, it's, it's higher density because of a higher pressure. So we got more stuff packed in tighter down here near the surface. But as you go higher up in elevation and eventually, you know, head up into the sky and go further and further out towards space, we get less uh, pressure here because of there's a lower density, meaning there are less of these things packed into one area as we, you know, work our way up begin toward space. And if you just think about that logically, like, you know, we see people in planes going up into the stratosphere or, you know, astronauts going up or whatever you need to be able to, you know, have that oxygen pumped in, it's because of that lower pressure, okay? We also describe this as the air being thinner, okay? And if you've ever, like, we describe that if you're, you know, down at sea level, 
and then you you know go up to the top of a mountain, it's going to be a lot harder to breathe when you get up to the top of that mountain. It's because as you're breathing in, you know there's lower pressure, so you're getting less oxygen in with each breath. Right? It takes a while for your body to to deal with that, uh, and so that's just that's what we're talking about here. Right? That's the idea. So pressure lessens. We have lower air pressure as you go higher and higher in elevation. Okay. Now with this, like a lot of this, I was talking about how, you know, it was the 18th century and Joseph Priestley killing mice and all that took us a while to figure stuff out. Some of this other stuff, it's, it's pretty new um, from like the mid to late 20th century. And that's because we had better advances in aircraft. Uh, and here in this country, we were freaked out by them Soviets because they were starting to put people in space and all that. And we felt kind of lame not being able to put anybody in space. So after World War II, we really start pushing to be able to you know, get humans up into space. Okay, In space, it's a, it's a fuzzy term. Uh, and I'll show some different layers of the atmosphere and all that in a bit. Um, but it's the idea of just, you know, getting up outside of our comfort zone. If you want to think about that, getting into some of these areas where there's lower pressure, where that air is thinner, where, you know, we just hadn't sent humans yet, right? That was, that was our goal. And as we start sending more and more people up there to simply, you know, get people, it really just, it was, it was to beat the Russians. That was, you know, big part of our whole space or i mean you know why else go to the moon but you know then to give a big middle finger uh to lenin uh and stalin and those guys right that's the idea but as we're sending more people up there there's a concern with safety and the idea like yeah we know if you're flying around in a plane in the the troposphere which is our layer of the atmosphere here we know you know pilots can eject and they can have a parachute and be okay if something goes wrong once they get up you know closer and closer to outer space does that even work? Do parachutes even work? Where it's, you know, clear we have this lower pressure. How are we going to find that out? I'll tell you how. We're going to send a guy up in a tin can, right, in a plastic bag, hot air balloon. We'll send him up into space, and we'll push him out of the tin can, and we'll see if he makes it. Right? It's the American way. How awesome is that? So in 1960, it's the first time that Joseph Kittinger here, uh, who's in the, the picture, he goes up into the stratosphere. He rides in a hot air balloon. And you can look at YouTube or all sorts of videos of this stuff. I mean, it does not look that high tech at all. It looks like a plastic trash bag and a tin can. And he gets in it and it goes about 20 miles up into the stratosphere, which is that first level of the atmosphere past our troposphere. Uh, and he's in this balloon and he jumps out. He's got a parachute, but he jumps out because, you know, we got to know. And not only does he do it, look how happy he is. I mean, my God, that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, and I don't know anything about the guy personally. I'm not going to build a statue for the guy. I mean, I don't know. But it's still, it's pretty cool to jump out of a tin can in space and not have anybody do it before and not know if it's going to work out, right? So here's a, a, an image from it. And I don't know if you, have you, have you gone skydiving before? You geographers listening to this, any skydivers out there? See, this is why I like to usually be teaching in front of a class, because I would have my hand up right now, saying, hey, put your hand up if you've, you've jumped out of a plane before and made it, you know, that kind of deal. Um, I've never done it at all. I wouldn't do it. That's stupid. Um, but I keep my hand up, so I look pretty hardcore, and like everybody in class was like, wow, I bet he's jumped out. Wow, what a cool guy. No, I've never done it. It looks terrifying. Um, I look at this picture. I'm not going to lie. I look at this picture right here. Of, uh, and this is Joe when he like just jumps out right here and to see how tiny the earth is in relation to him like I'm I'm peeing my pants just a little bit just looking at this right at this picture that that happened uh, decades ago right I'm not jumping out of a plane my god but I've seen TV I've seen movies I've seen people jump out of airplanes before right you with me fellow cowards uh, yeah so think about it what happens when uh, you jump out of a, when an actor on a television show jumps out of a plane. What happens to their clothes? Let me put it that way. They're flapping around. 
right? All that wind is flapping around and the clothes are flapping around. Everybody's shouting to be heard over the flapping and the engine noise and all that stuff. And as they jump out, it's just as they're falling down, right? That's, that's skydiving. So I've been told, right? Okay, so great. Here's the deal. When you do this in the stratosphere, when Kinger gets up there and he's, he's in the balloon and he jumps out, nothing. Right? He's going over 600 miles per hour, but you wouldn't know it based on like what his clothes are doing or the experience that he's having right there, right? Everything's still, but the earth is getting bigger, much faster than it should be, right? So going over 600 miles per hour. That's so cool. And it's that there's nothing happening because there's no resistance because the air is so thin because of that lower pressure, right? And then once he hits the troposphere, once he actually enters into our layer of the atmosphere, so he's technically returning from space, uh, we have what's called terminal velocity, which means if you jump out of a plane and you don't have a parachute or whatever, you don't you know, pull it right away, the fastest you're going to go is 125 miles per hour. You get it top out roughly around there um, with the, you know, the pull of gravity, but also the resistance from the atmosphere itself. So he starts out at over 600 miles an hour. He's flying and he actually has to slow down to terminal velocity once he gets into the troposphere. Amazing. And there's a link here for a YouTube uh, video. I mean, you can just do Project Excelsior, Joseph Kittinger, and YouTube, and there's all sorts of footage. And it is amazing to see, if for no other reason than just how lame everything looks. Like a suit, you can't really see it here. Honestly, it looks like he's got some coveralls and some vacuum cleaner parts and stuff like that. And the suit apparently weighed like 150 pounds. So you can see footage of him kind of waddling because it's so hard to uh, walk in. But my God, this does not look... This does not look high tech enough for me to even remotely feel comfortable in doing this, right? Like it looks like something I could build in my garage, which is not, I should not be able to build something like this in my garage if we're trying to get a guy down safely from space. But he made it and he jumped like three more times. Amazing. And we learned a lot about not just, you know, the stratosphere and, and this stuff. And, you know, of course, a lot of data are being taken through all this. But we also learned that, yeah, people can do this, right? We're learning what humans can do. And so for many, many decades, he held the record for the, you know, the highest skydiving uh, effort ever. Uh, and it wasn't until a little while ago now, maybe a decade ago now, I don't even remember exactly when, but we had the Red Bull guy, the Red Bull guy. You guys remember this? Again, I, it's it's been a while now since the guy did it. Um, but it was an effort to replicate Kittinger's original jumps. And and Kittinger was a, a consultant on all of this, and NASA was working. It wasn't all Red Bull, although they were the ones who were footing the bill, which is the saddest thing in the world about American science, uh, is that we need our energy drink people, you know, to pay for this uh, um, stuff. Uh, and yeah, and the guy who did it, Felix Baumgartner, not even an American, my God. An Austrian. Disgusting. It's probably a nice guy. I don't know. Build a statue. I don't know. Or don't. Whatever. But the idea is not even a good American guy like Joe Kittinger. We have to get soda and Austrians to do this stuff. But he did it and he went higher. And when you look at the suit, too, what I love is you see this image. Like the LA Times isn't doing, you know, Kittinger any favors. He's just kind of falling toward Earth. I mean, it, it kind of looks like in that first Iron Man movie, like the thing he makes in the cave. Versus the actual Iron Man suit. You know, this guy's falling. This guy's flying. Clearly. But yeah, he went up higher. Got up to about 700 miles per hour. Still made it. I mean, just fantastic. Right? And you can see from this image. Here's the troposphere. Which is where we exist. This is where life exists. The stratosphere. Which these guys are just barely getting into. As well, right? But this is really when outer space. Or space, anyway begins um, where we're leaving Earth at that point, right? And then we got the mesosphere and the thermosphere uh, above that. Um, but pretty cool stuff. Simply, I mean, sure, so because we learn stuff, but also it's just it's just cool. 
It's just people doing stupid stuff, right? That's that's science uh, in, in many cases, or at least you know it's geography quite often, and and the sciences that that I've always liked. So because we've had people going up in balloons and jumping out of balloons, and we keep trying to you know study the atmosphere around us, and in our early efforts to get people up into outer space, and we you know continue to do this stuff, we're constantly recording data out in the atmosphere, and we've learned a lot about it since the days of you know putting uh, mice in jars and all that. So as I said, troposphere. That's where we're at. Stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere. Don't stress out over these things. And I'm not going to test you on, like, you know, at what point does the stratosphere begin? That kind of stuff. But one thing that's relevant or will be relevant as we start getting into, you know, temperature stuff and and uh, um, climate data and, and all of that uh, has to do with temperature and what it does in the atmosphere. So this line... This black line here is temperature, as we're into, you can read down here, in Celsius. Um, so from the surface, as you go up, what we're seeing in the troposphere is the higher you go, the colder it's going to get, right? Which makes sense when you think about it. Like, where do we find snow? Up at the top of the mountain, right? Um, that's where you'll see snow year-round. <clears throat> and uh, or you know longer into the summer or, or whatever right the higher up we go the colder it gets and that seems pretty obvious but honestly that only works here in the troposphere uh because once we get into the stratosphere temperature is going to go up so the higher you go the greater the temperature and then it actually starts to dip back down in the mesosphere but then when we get to the thermosphere it heats back up again the higher you go Right, And all we really need to worry about in here is this idea in the troposphere that the greater the elevation, the, the colder the temperatures. And it's what we call the lapse rate or normal lapse rate uh, quite often. Uh, and it's simply, it's an actual rate at which temperatures drop. And don't worry about memorizing this stuff. Again, just keep in, in mind this idea. The higher up I go in elevation, the colder the temperature is going to be. And that'll be important in understanding, you know, temperature controls in general. We talk about some of that weather stuff and climate stuff. It'll help explain the highland climate, which we'll, we'll get into. So in the troposphere, the higher you go, the colder it gets. Now, another thing going on with the atmosphere is that it's, it's doing stuff. As I said, it's got this functionality so we could not exist without it, not just because of oxygen, but because it's keeping some nasty stuff away from us. And so the atmosphere acts as a membrane. We actually have two kind of key membranes here. And if you think back from your biology classes, which I know you all took and, and excelled in and all that, like cellular membrane. Do you remember that concept? Of course you do. I'm sure you're all raising your hands and nodding. I'll just, I'll take your words for it. A uh, membrane, that example, it's something that allows certain things to pass through, so to actually enter the cell, but then other stuff is kept out, right? It's like a filter, right? And that's what's happening with the atmosphere, okay? And we have two key things here. We have the ionosphere and the ozonosphere, okay? The first one, the ionosphere, that's our first line of defense. So it's up here. What this image is showing, we've got our electromagnetic spectrum. So these are the different wavelengths of that radiant energy that's coming from the sun. Some of this stuff, visible light, cool. We did it on. Uh, but other things, gamma rays, x-rays, that's pretty nasty uh, uh, stuff. Like, you know, x-rays, right? You go to the dentist or, you know, in some case you're in the ER or whatever. Uh, they want to see inside your body without digging around. You get blasted with some x-rays so they can take that picture, right? They can see our bones to see if we've got cavities or a break in our arm or like whatever, right? And of course, like it's useful, but you know, the people who are actually the x-ray technicians, are they hanging out with you at the time that they do that? Of course not. They're hiding behind a wall. You're wearing the heavy-duty lead stuff, and that's to limit the x-rays that are actually entering your body. Right, because they're so 
bad for us, right? They're coming from the sun, but they don't make it down here. So we can utilize x-rays down here, but they actually the ones that are you know coming from the sun, they're not getting down to us because of this ionosphere. So this is just a great first line of defense where a lot of this really hardcore nasty radiation is kept out of the earth, right? So fantastic. Ionosphere, great. And one good thing too, I have yet to find, I mean, I could be wrong, uh, but I don't think there's a way for us humans to destroy it, which is it was a plus because as we'll see in a minute and in you know future lectures, there's plenty of other stuff that we humans have figured out ways to destroy, which is unfortunate, but the ionosphere seems pretty safe for now. So we got that going for us. Now the ozonosphere, oh, we messed this up pretty good. Um, this is down lower in the stratosphere, so closer to the surface. And we often just refer to this as the ozone layer, okay? Uh, and ozone is simply, it's a molecule. It's three uh, oxygen atoms stuck together. So we breathe in O2, but ozone is O3, okay? And we don't want to breathe in ozone. That will destroy lung tissue if we you know, suck that in. So it's bad for us. We don't like tropospheric ozone, which can come from like, you know, pollution and, and all that. Um, so we don't want to breathe that in because that's bad for us. But stratospheric ozone, the stuff high up in the stratosphere, is fantastic because we're not up there breathing anyway. So we're cool. Um, and what it does is it actually takes in ultraviolet radiation. Okay. Uh, or at least some, a good chunk, I should say, of the uh, ultraviolet radiation that's coming from the sun. And it just absorbs it and, you know, changes the wavelength. It's just converted to simple heat energy. Nothing we got to worry about at all. So this is quite useful. And, and UV rays, we've got UV A, B, and C. And like if you buy sunblock or sunglasses or whatever, it'll say broad spectrum or it'll say UVA and UVB projection or something like that. It's, it's talking about the different types of ultraviolet radiation. Okay? We don't have to worry about UVC radiation coming down here because the ozone doesn't let it through. Okay? So all that is stopped up there in the stratosphere. And 90% of the UVB rays don't make it down here either. Right? So there's a tiny little amount of UVB and then the UVA rays come down okay and so we get like our sunblock uh that we should all be wearing um you know it should protect us from both the uva and the uvb to get those last little bits of rays that the uh, the ozone layer isn't able to stop okay so the ozone layer the ozonosphere so important really we really should be taking care of it oh but um we broke it uh put a hole and, it, uh, and it's not technically a hole, it's a thinning of um, ozone. Uh, and it's above Antarctica. It was in 2006 when it peaked, right? So that seems like a while ago. And, and it, hasn't, it hasn't gotten worse, you can say that. Um, it's kind of plateau. We're, we're trying, we're, we're baby stepping, we're trying to make this better. Yeah, but we broke the ozone layer, it turns out. And I say we, meaning not just, you know, it's Americans, but anybody else. In the modern world, anyone who uses industrial products or who did, uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s when a lot of this stuff, you know, we start realizing what's going on, uh, you know, everybody was to blame for it, some more than others, meaning us uh, and you know, the other really wealthy countries. Um, but still, you can see it's over, like this hole is over Antarctica, where nobody actually lives, at least not permanently. Um, so you could say like, you know, did we really do this? But this gets into global winds and some stuff I'll talk about in a moment. So the pollution stuff that led to this that I'll get into, it starts in like North America, but gets blown up, you know, up into the stratosphere. And these, these chemicals, these CFCs I'm going to talk about, work their way down to the South Pole. Okay. So even though it's not above us, we're all to blame for this stuff and we we realize it okay now here's the issue this thinning that's occurring it means we have less ozone which means there's less 
of a barrier there to stop ultraviolet radiation. So more UV rays are getting in to the uh, the troposphere, right, and making it down to the surface. Now clearly, UV rays bad for our skin. You know, not only just sunburns and stuff, but it can screw up our eyes or it leads to skin cancer. We don't want any more UV rays than we, you know, than we get, right? We want to avoid that. But also, ultraviolet radiation can be damaging to uh, ecosystems. We use ultraviolet rays to purify stuff for water purification or things like, uh, uh, you know, we have UV light to clean equipment like laboratory equipment uh, and all of that where it's just you know the, the radiation is sent out and it's going to kill all the little you know creepy crawlies and stuff that are on your lab goggles or your equipment or, or whatever it just zaps that kills the germs disinfects it without having to wipe it down and get the stuff wet you know using a chemical or whatever right so that's great like a laboratory setting or in your home or whatever not so great like say out in the oceans or in you know different ecosystems or, or whatever we don't want to kill the the tiny little things because those can be food for other you know slightly larger things that is food for other stuff that's a little bit bigger and and so on right so it's not just a selfish oh i don't want to have more sunburns uh it's, it's more a case of uh you know we don't want to destroy you know nature to put it quite bluntly right so that's that's the concern that's why we care now we find out that the whole reason for this is because of our own, you know, clever chemistry work that we have. So we have these chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, which are, um, they're synthetic things. I mean, we, we make them in a lab, okay? We, we take chlorine uh, and, and this other stuff, stick it together, and we've got these great, um, you know, little synthetic molecules that we can use for industrial purposes. Right? And so with these, what's great about them is they're so stable. Okay, That's a, uh, a big key thing here is that uh, they don't break apart. They don't dissolve or get, or, you know, ruined or anything. So they can, they stick around. They're durable and they're kind of cheap. And so, yeah, we want to use them. We use them for refrigeration and air conditioning and, and that kind of stuff. Aerosol sprays, used CFCs. And it was the idea that, you know, with an aerosol spray, whatever you have, the hairspray, the spray paint, like whatever it might be, um, we, you know, have the stuff, let's say it's, you know, hairspray, uh, in there, in the can. But you also have these aerosols, which are smaller little molecules than the hairspray itself. And it's around that aerosol that that hairspray can glob on. And then it sprays out of the can and, you know, sticks to your beautiful hair. Um, and then, you know, that'll just kind of slowly break down over the day, right? But these CFCs, they're tough. So they just kind of float around in the atmosphere and eventually make their way up into the stratosphere. Now, here's the issue. And don't worry, I'm, I'm making fun of chemists, so I'm not going to make you do chemistry or figure out how this works exactly um, or whatever. Don't worry about that. Let the nerds worry about the details here. But what you should know is with these CFCs, when they get up to the stratosphere, they're hit by ultraviolet radiation, and that actually causes them to break apart. Okay, And so it's the chlorine, once that breaks off, that actually goes off and finds the ozone and breaks ozone apart, right? So it breaks it into, we've got oxygen, the O2, which is useless to us up in the stratosphere, and then this chlorine monoxide, so the one chlorine uh, uh, atom and the, the one oxygen stuck together there, and it's useless uh, up there as well. None, none of this is going to actually help with UV rays, right? So the more uh, of these CFCs that get up there, they're broken apart by the ultraviolet radiation, it's going to destroy ozone. And so that's where this thinning or this hole, so we tend to call it, uh, is coming from, okay? But we know this is the case, and we knew this was the case back in the 80s and 90s. We started figuring this stuff out, and my God, we actually came together as a globe, and we, like different countries, came together and said, hey, we're screwing up the planet. We should stop it. 
and and we did it. I know. I mean, it's amazing to think about today when we've got stuff that's even scarier that's, you know, screwing up the planet. Uh, and, you know, in our country is going, no, we don't want to fix it, right? We, we signed on to this. Like, we were cool with this whole Montreal Protocol where we said, look, okay, we're done with CFCs. And everybody said, yeah, we're done with CFCs. And by done, it was it's a phase-out process. Like, you can see here... CFCs plan to be phased out um, between 2010 to 2030. Now, clearly, we missed that first decade. We still haven't fully gotten rid of all of this stuff. Um, but it's the idea that why we've done it this way, which you can see from the chart, it's showing it's a success in that we're, we're stopping it from getting worse. Okay, We're addressing the problem. We're trying to slow this down because uh, we, you know, we don't want the ozone hole to get worse. We don't want to continue to destroy this stuff. But it's also, to get rid of these CFCs, that's an expensive process, right? Because they were everywhere. Like I said, like air conditioning and refrigeration and stuff like that. Cars from, you know, prior to this protocol going into effect, and it was like the mid-90s when a lot of this stuff went into place here, um, where it was a case like you, if you bought a new car, Right, that had an air conditioner after a certain date, you were gonna. It was gonna be a little more expensive because they were gonna use non-CFC refrigeration stuff in there for the air conditioner. Um, but you know, you weren't. You're buying a car. You don't even like notice that stuff if you're financing this. It wasn't a big deal. So we weren't gonna make anybody who was driving a car from you know like the late '80s or early '90s or whatever. We weren't gonna make people you know throw out their air conditioners and buy new ones. Now, if you already got it cool but anything you buy from here on out no we're, we're not going to uh no um you're not going to use it anymore yeah that was the idea so that's what we mean by a phase out so not a big deal like if you're going to buy new hairspray uh or something like that but buying these expensive appliances and and things in our cars and and all of that could it could cost a lot of money all right so we did this phase out process that's the idea um, and you know, maybe not the best way to do it. Maybe we could have been more aggressive, but you know, this EPA chart, what it's showing is that, uh, yeah, it could be a lot worse. So we got that going for us. And honestly, these days looking back, like this is a huge victory compared to how we behave today. So yeah, we're almost done with CFCs, except, uh, here's this deal. This, this is crazy and maybe it's not the sexiest international mystery or conspiracy thing or whatever you know maybe it's not as cool as this other stuff you read about but this is i think it's sexy this is pretty cool and scary folks somebody's making cfcs we have mystery black market cfcs out there somewhere and these were picked up um, you know, at, through all of the, these observations people are doing of the atmosphere to understand, you know, a whole host of things, climate change being one of them, like getting a sense of the gases that are up there, we discover, you know what, the, there, there are more CFCs showing up that shouldn't be there, right? So with this, this um, phase out and all that, we didn't have any, it was, you know, starting to diminish and all that, and then suddenly... They're back. They're back. And it appears to be, and I hate, I hate to say it, uh, it appears to be China. Somewhere in China is what the evidence, uh, according to, I, mean, I haven't fully, okay, I'm trying to say it's sexy. It's not, I haven't read that much about uh, this stuff. But it's it's looking like somewhere in eastern China is, is from where these things are originating. And I hesitate to do that because poor China gets beat up enough with all the coronavirus stuff and you know, the racism uh, that, that we here in this country love to uh, throw at the Chinese. Take Geography 105. We talk about it in there. It's been going on for a while. Um, but still, it looks like somebody's manufacturing this stuff. And that's a concern, right? Because that means we're right back where we started with this stuff, where that, that uh, ozone layer is going to continue to get attacked and destroyed. And once again, it's a case of, you know, it's all, it's all for profit. 
It's because CFCs are cheap and they work, uh, and everybody likes them from that standpoint, even if they're destroying the planet. It's kind of the same thing with oil and gas and, and all that. It's always about profit, never about what's the smartest thing, the smartest long-term plan, right? So we should be paying attention to this stuff. We should be dealing with it, but we're not because, you know... It's invisible gas in the stratosphere. It's not, okay, it's not that sexy. But look, let me put it to you this way. It's terrifying. Terrifying. Wake up, people. My God, fear the CFCs. Here's why, okay? This ultraviolet stuff, it is bad. We don't want any more of this stuff. Put on your sunblock. Put it on twice. Wear a hat. All that. UVB radiation. Remember, that's about 10% of it that's coming from the sun. It's going to make it down here. This is what actually gives us that sunburn the painful experience of getting a sunburn uh, and it also damages our eyes so it's just there's no good coming from this now the uva rays you know initially looks pretty good right and i know i'm talking to you know the demographics here a bunch of you are like 18 or 19 or whatever and you go out and you sit in the sun and you're like oh, i'm beautiful and you have that healthy glow it's gonna catch up all right, UVA is what ages your skin, gives it that leathery look. Uh, and this is why, I, this is actually why I like um, doing this online, because you can't see the tough leathery look that I have, because I'm far from 18, uh, and spent time outside uh, and, and thought, ah, old people, I'll never look like you, and here I am. Right, and both UVA and UVB leads to skin cancer, and it's awful. And it just, we don't want it. Right, and so like not only do we want sunblock and wear sunglasses and all that stuff, but we also like if we got an invisible force field up there that's keeping a lot of this stuff out, we want to keep that healthy, right? So that's that's a key thing. Now this image, this stuff fascinates me. Um, that dermatologists will do this for you. Take pictures of your skin. Uh, you know, this is the guy on the left here. I don't know how to explain it. This is what we would see right here, and then this disturbing looking things with this special sun damage camera. I don't know how it works, um, but it's terrible. Just to look at that, that is not, it's not good, right? Can you see that? My goodness, stop with the CFCs. In fact, this freaked me out so much and I'm really starting to take care of my body and, and pay attention to it and, and yeah, because death is approaching. Um, but yeah, I actually went to a dermatologist. I did this before the whole coronavirus thing so it wasn't a big deal i didn't have to wear a mask uh, or whatever but i got the same image taken in fact well i have i have it here I'll, I'll show it to you that's me right kids because i didn't listen you know to the old people who were telling me to wear a hat and put on sunblock and all that stuff that's me in fact no that's not even the skin damage uh, uh camera that's just the normal one under fluorescent lights that's how that's how rough my life has been so are we gonna fix we, we're going to fix the CFC issue? We're going to go to war with China or whatever? It, I don't even know if it's really full. It was just what I read. That's what it was looking at. Like, don't get, don't be anti-Asian. Um, my God, they've got enough problems with everything in this country. Um, uh, but no, but it, it's something we need to be aware of. Uh, okay, pep talk over. Um, right there. Now let's move into wind stuff. We just love, you know... We'll leave the sun damage, skin damage uh, stuff behind, and we'll get into winds and how these things work. All right? And oh, and one thing, as we move on, as we get away from the ozone layer, I want to make it clear in here that the hole in the ozone layer, it's different from climate change, okay? And the greenhouse effect and global warming. For whatever reason, I guess because all these things are happening up in the sky, students will often, like when on your second exam, you're going to have to uh, explain climate change on there. And I'll get into more detail in that stuff when, with the climate change lectures. Um, but quite, a, I'll have students who start throwing in this ozone hole stuff. Don't do it. Okay, let me just stress that. And it can get kind of confusing with how CFCs and stuff can act as greenhouse gas and the I mean there's there are little things here and there but look what I'm telling you is ozone layer 
greenhouse effect, totally separate things. Okay. Both bad, both things we, you know, we don't want to, you know, we humans are continuing to make worse uh, and we don't want to do that. So, I mean, yeah, there's that. But when I'm talking to you about climate change, we're, we're not talking about the ozone layer. You follow? Hopefully you follow. So I just want to stress that because that, that's an issue um, that, that comes up. Okay, so now we're going to get into winds, and I'm going to go through this stuff relatively quickly. I'm going to explain how winds work. I'll, I'll begin to introduce some of the global wind stuff, um, but we're going to talk more about that with we get into modern climate patterns and all that in the next, I think it's the next lecture, And but I'll, I'll make sure, I'll spend some time on local wind events. So you get a sense of why the Antelope Valley is the way it is, why it is so windy, and what kind of winds we're dealing with. Okay, so that's that's the plan now. Okay, so in terms of wind, it's actually pretty simple and straightforward. Okay, with wind, it has to do with different air pressure here on the surface. And I mean, yeah, we have winds that go up. We can have higher things, but we're keeping it simple here. So just think of the surface of the Earth, like we see with this image right here. Okay, so the Earth's surface has different heating that's going on, okay? We can have warmer surfaces and cooler surfaces and all that. And it has to do with whether we're dealing with a body of water versus land. Uh, it can be different, like we talked about albedo and stuff like that, just, you know, color or the material or, or whatever. That kind of stuff can all affect the temperatures we feel on the surface here, okay? Now, wind is simply where we have air from an area of higher pressure, okay? And that, that typically, it, it ties in with a cooler surface. So I think it's colder, it's more dense, this stuff is packed together, okay? So it's hanging out over here and everything's great. Uh, but then it discovers an area, a warmer area. So by definition, it's going to be an area of lower pressure. And so what wind is, it's a pressure gradient meaning air from this area of high pressure is moving to the area of low pressure with the idea that it's it's trying to equalize, okay? And I know I'm, I'm speaking about this like, like winds are like, we can do it, like they've got agency uh, and all that. No, it's just how my brain works, right? It's not, it's not like the oxygen and nitrogen molecules are thinking uh, about this stuff. It's, it's physics is what's going on here, right? So high pressure... Air from there is going to move toward that area of low pressure to kind of balance everything out and just have nice in the middle medium pressure. Okay, that's the that's the idea there. Okay, so that's all wind really is. Of course, it, it's we're not going to let it still be that simple because there are a few other things going on. But that's the general idea. Okay, high pressure to low pressure, a pressure gradient. So air is moving from that high pressure to the low pressure. The problem, though, is that we're on this round-ish planet that's moving, right? We're rotating. We're rotating to the east, right? And so because of that, it does something wacky to our wind. We have what's called the Coriolis effect, or sometimes it's called the Coriolis force. And so it's the rotation of the Earth actually makes wind do this weird stuff. In the northern hemisphere, winds are going to pull to the right or turn to the right, however you want to phrase that, okay? In the southern hemisphere, they're going to turn or pull to the uh, left. And you can see with this, it also depends on the actual direction in which they're traveling. But something going straight up toward the North Pole, you can see that wind is actually going to move to the right. So what we're going to see actually happen uh, is this dashed line right here, okay? And then in the South Pole, heading to the South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere, the air is going to move to the left. And it's this opposite thing. It's really, it's because we're rotating to the east. Uh, and so if you look at it, it's kind of this mirror image thing, if that makes sense. Okay, but, and I'll show some, you know, examples uh, of this stuff. But just remember what this Coriolis effect is, because that becomes important for some stuff that we're going to get into. Okay, um, and here, this is, this is how to think about it. Uh, I love this. 
idea right here. Unfortunately, like I don't know if you guys have played on merry-go-rounds. We seem to have gotten rid of them uh, around the country, or at least here in California, because honestly, they're death traps. I mean, my God, I, it's amazing that any of us who grew up in the 70s or 80s or even 90s um, made it uh, because we had these spinning metal discs of death uh, out of playgrounds, and this is what we'd play on. And you could get going fast, and kids would fly off it, and you know, you'd land in the wood chips, and you'd be okay. Um, but, you know, we got rid of them. But these are great for testing stuff, like the Coriolis effect. And so what this is showing, uh, right up here at the top, is that we got the guy in the center with the basketball, okay, and, and the friend over here on the edge, and then we got this person of our kind of control or reference um, out there off of the merry-go-round, right? So this is spinning, okay, at this time, and this guy is getting ready to pass the basketball to this person right there, right? But because it's spinning, he's going to push it, and it's still going to move in this direction because it's flying through the air, right? Um, so the basketball is still doing what the basketball's supposed to be doing. It's still going this way, like we see here. So eventually this person off the merry-go-round will be able to catch it. But for these two, it's going to look crazy because you pass it out there and it's going to start to go out in front of you and then turn to the right, like we see here. So for this guy, I realize I'm doing all these hand motions by myself here to make it clear. Um, you couldn't see that. Um, so this, he passes it. It's going to go out and curve this way, right? That's the Coriolis effect. It's because the earth is doing the moving, the wind that's moving through the air, it's as we're mapping it. That's where we're getting the um, the curving going on, right? We're mapping something like this, even though the wind's just doing what the wind is doing. Does that make sense? I don't know. If it doesn't make sense, if it's still too weird, just remember what it is, right? That general idea, and it turns to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left, in the southern hemisphere. But here's an example <laughs> off the merry-go-round. So this is showing our pressure gradient, uh, 950 millibars over here, 925 right there. So we've got high pressure, low pressure. So that pressure gradient means the air wants to go this way, the wind is blowing this way, but because of our rotation of the earth, it's going to appear, again, as we're mapping this stuff, where the wind starts and where it ends up, then it's curving this way, right? That's that's the idea with the Coriolis effect. And so the moving winds and, and all the rotation, it does some crazy, crazy stuff. We're not, I'm going to skip through cyclones and anti-cyclones. I'm tired. Uh, and again, if you're really down with this stuff, Geography 102, it's it, it will blow your mind. Uh, but what this is doing... What this helps to explain are the weather patterns in North America, why we have, um, you know, drier weather uh, over here. I mean, you, you hopefully have already or just listened to that uh, water stuff, talked about drought in the West. Um, you know, this is in part, this is why, okay? Uh, whereas, you know, over here on the uh, East Coast, they've got more rain. It's, again, because of, of rotations and cyclones and anticyclones and air going up and air coming down and all that stuff. That's the idea. All right, so we're going to skip, move through that. Don't worry about that stuff for here. Uh, instead, we're going to move on to this global stuff. And again, briefly, because, you know, I'll, I'll talk more about this when we get into some climate stuff. But the general idea... I think if we're just trying to make a, a quick model about this, is that we're going to have high pressure up here at the North Pole and at the South Pole. Okay? It's colder, right? It's covered in ice, right? So we've got that area of high pressure. And then down at the equator, it's hot year-round, so we're going to have low pressure there. So what air around the planet wants to do is move from the poles down to the equator, and then it's going to converge here at the equator and get shoved up, and that's actually going to kick it back toward the poles, and that's going to descend, and it's going to go back, and we would have these cells, meaning just these, you know, cyclical things here, these cycles of air moving 
from the pole down to the equator, back up higher into the atmosphere, back to the poles, and it would just keep going, right? Like a treadmill or, or whatever, right? That's the, the idea. Now, the problem is we got this whole Coriolis effect at work. So we don't have one continuous cell. We actually have multiple cells, okay? So the only one we're actually going to talk about in this class is the Hadley cell. Um, because we're not, we're not going to dwell that much, honestly, on the Arctic or Antarctic. It's cold up there, generally speaking. I mean, just recently, as I record this, uh, in Siberia, uh, they actually recorded a temperature over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's AV weather, right? Like, we actually we haven't had anything that hot in the, the last few days, but in Siberia... They're dealing with it. So it's supposed to be cold up here, but climate change. We'll, we'll talk about that. Global warming, all that uh, stuff. So we'll get into that, but we're not going to dwell here. Instead, I just want to focus on the Hadley cell, because that's key for some, some big things we're going to talk about. And so it's the idea we still have air coming from the north or the south here, moving toward the equator, and then it converges, meaning it hits together and gets it has nowhere to go but up. Okay, so that air goes up, and then it starts heading back toward the uh, poles, but because of this whole Coriolis effect, it gets kicked back at roughly 30 degrees north or south. Okay, so it's this, this little cell here that doesn't go all the way up to the North Pole or to the South Pole. Okay, that's the general idea. Now, this is key for two very distinct types of climate regions that we'll be getting into, but what we have here around the equator, where these air masses converge, is what we call the ITCZ, okay, which stands for Intertropical Convergence Zone. Okay, And so this Intertropical Convergence Zone, it's, I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense when you think about it, right? Tropics refers to latitude, so around the equator and roughly you know, 23 and a half degrees north, 23 and a half degrees south, right? The middle of the uh, planet, that's our tropics. So it's meeting in the tropics, it's converging, and it's a zone, right? So, you know, think of it that way. But it's where these air masses come together and get pushed up. And here's the general rule of thumb is, when you have air going up, you have rain falling down. Okay, that's not a very scientific way of saying it, but it's something that just makes sense, like, you know, as humans speak. So, it's, you know, vertically ascending air will lead to unstable conditions. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how we get all nerdy about it. But it's air goes up, rain is going to fall down. Okay, so at this ITCZ, this is in a region where we have some of the heaviest rainfall throughout the world, and consistently so. Okay, here's another way to to uh, look at it here. Um, so the equator, you know, running here, it moves. And so what this is showing is we have in July and in January, it moves with the seasons. And that has to do with the subsolar point and pressure gradient stuff and all sorts of things like that. But wherever this line is throughout the year, it's where we've got a lot of rain falling down. Okay? And it's no coincidence that we have the Amazon rainforest here. We have the Congo over here. We have incredible uh, rainforest in Malaysia and Borneo and areas of uh, Southeast Asia uh, in this area, right? We'll, we'll talk about the monsoon in the next lecture, uh, which is why we have some incredible forests in India, but we also have a very distinct rainy and dry season, okay? So that's, that's what this ITCZ does, and it's all because of these global wind patterns. So we'll talk more about the details there when we get there. Same thing with the monsoon. Don't worry about the details here. It's just this idea that the ITCZ moves up into South Asia. So into India, you know, primarily is what we're talking about. Moves into there, rain falls down, and then moves out of there. And they have a dry season. That's what the monsoon is. I'll cover that more in the next one. Okay. Now another thing we have happening is where this, this Hadley cell descends, we get what's called a subtropical high pressure cell. Okay, the subtropics, it refers to, 
you know, roughly 25 to 35 degrees north or south. So it's this transition zone, leaving the tropics, you know, getting into the mid latitudes, stuff we'll cover next time. Um, but it's just where these cells descend. And so when we have air going up, we have rain coming down. But when we have air going down, it's dry. No rain. We don't have storms. We call it stable conditions, fair skies. We're not going to get rain clouds. We're not going to get precipitation. Okay? So with these subtropical high-pressure cells, where these come down, we don't have any rain. Right? Or it will deflock, deflect or block moisture from coming into an area. So like we see this one right here, um, this affects northern Africa. Uh, so we've got, you know, the Congos, incredible rainforest down here. Up here we have the Sahara Desert, right? This incredibly dry location. And that has to do uh, with the subtropical high pressure cell. And we'll be talking about deserts more in the next lecture. Okay, so that's, that's the idea there. And true, if you're going to be a pirate, pay attention to this. Let's skip this. Here we go. I'm going I'm to get to what's happening here. All right, as uh, the window uh, near me is, is rattling uh, around as winds are picking up around here. Let's talk about locally what's happening here in the Antelope Valley. And primarily, our prevailing winds, what we're normally experiencing, or what we call Chinook winds, okay, based on this concept right here. So this is a generic model, but this totally works for California uh, and what we're experiencing here in the Antelope Valley. So imagine this is the Pacific Ocean. You know, we got LA and stuff on, on this side of the mountains here. We've got our we've got the San Gabriels and the Sierra Nevada and the, the different mountain ranges nearby us. And then this is us over here, right? What happens is, Think back to like the hydrological cycle, that water cycle we talked about. Got evaporation happening out in the oceans. Moisture-filled air is coming on shore. And as that moves on shore and runs into mountains right here, we call that orographic lifting. So it's where the air gets pushed up. The mountains act as like a ramp, right? So that air gets shoved upward. And what happens when air goes up? Rain falls down, right? But it's all falling down on this windward side of the mountains. So in our example here in California, on the western side of something like the Sierra Nevada, right? So the air goes up, the rain is falling down over there, but as it crosses the mountains and the air then descends onto that leeward side, or our eastern side, as it comes here into the Antelope Valley, air is going down, so we're gonna have fair conditions. We're not gonna get any of that rain. Right? Instead, we're just going to get fast, dry wind. And that's, you know, that not only explains the, uh, um, the winds that we get here in the Antelope Valley, but it's also why we're a desert. Right? Because that rain doesn't make it over here. It rains on the other side of the mountains, and as it descends, we get clear skies. And therefore, we are a desert. Now, in Southern California... It's not quite as obvious. You could really see it if you go up further north. Like you go from Lake Tahoe on the western side of the Sierra Nevada. Um, and then you cross the mountains and you go down into like Reno. Very obvious. Where you go from lush green vegetation on the western side. Very dry brown desert stuff on the eastern side. Right? Very clear. We just generally get less rain down here in the south you know, generally speaking, so it's not quite as obvious, but still, that's why the Antelope Valley is the desert that it is. That's why the Mojave is the way it is, and that's why we have wind all the time. It's because of those damn mountains, right? And so here's a, a picture I took from uh, Marie Kerr Park, uh, and you can just see, you know, it's a still image. A video, I guess, would have been better, um, but what you can see if you look out toward the mountains is just this bank of clouds and the clouds don't seem to be moving and what it really is is they're you know they're getting pushed up on that other side of the mountains and it's going to be gloomy raining if not you know drizzling or something like that down in you know Santa Clarita on that side even in you know maybe in Acton um, or, or whatever depending on how far up this stuff gets or what the conditions are but here 
you know, no clouds on this side, but the wind is just beating against me as I'm taking this picture, right? And so notice that if you're feeling winds coming from the west, generally speaking, the western direction there, look to the mountains and quite often you can see this bank of clouds. That's the Chinook wind, right? That's what we are experiencing. And that's what we typically experience here in the AV. Again, all because of the mountains. All right, now the other type that we get are the Santa Anas. And we've heard of these. We talk about these a lot in Southern California because they're one of the reasons why we're constantly on fire. And these work, they actually kind of start in that same way, um, where we have air coming from the, you know, this windward side, crossing the mountains, heading into Nevada. So it's much further north from us, and it's heading into Nevada, okay? And it's drying out, like I just said. This is going from Tahoe down into Reno, getting the dry air just blowing in to Nevada. But then what happens is that if there's a low pressure system down here, you know, off the coast of LA, this high pressure up here, it picks up on that, right? And so it was cruising across California, going into Nevada, but then it spins around and goes, ho, ho, pressure gradient time, and then heads down toward LA, right? Again, to balance out. Now it's already pretty dry air. Any moisture has, you know, fell down uh, on the, you know, western side of the Sierra. It's gone into Northern California. So it's already dry and it's just continuing to dry out as it's, you know, cruising through Nevada and the whole Great Basin area here and coming into the Mojave Desert, okay? Then it hits the transverse ranges that we discussed before, but stuff like, you know, the San Gabriels, we've got the Tehachapis, which are kind of the southernmost part of the Sierra uh, Nevada. So we're nestled in between the, the San Gabriels. It's not the greatest image of these things, but there's a little V that or notch kind of thing that gets formed. That's the Antelope Valley that we're looking at. So these winds come along. And, you know, this makes it look like it's it's further out, you know, to the, the southeast from here. But this stuff flows into Lancaster and Palmdale. So these winds are coming from Nevada and more or less coming from the east, yeah, or the northeast uh, around there. So typically we get those Chinook winds coming from the west. But the Santa Anas, we know those are coming in when we're feeling wind coming from the east or the northeast. Okay, and then here's the deal is that... As these winds are coming through, they're already pretty decent winds blowing through here, but they get really nasty when they start to get squeezed into these mountains, okay? Which means like when they get to our little V-shaped notch here, the winds get get piled up, okay? And this, these images are from the, the LA Times. I like these because they help to, to help us make sense of it, envision what's happening. And, and the guy who illustrated this used the whole uh, hose you know, nozzle thing uh, as a great analogy. So out in the open desert, the winds aren't confined. But when they start going through these mountains, they get confined, just like, you know, hose water. And so if you, you attach this to a hose and you start to spray the water, it's going to come out quickly, right? Because it's confined in this smaller space. That's what the winds are doing. So as they whip through the AV and head down, like think of where the 14 is and going down through the San Gabriels there, you know, cars are able to do that. Winds are able to do that as well. So as they're shooting down along the 14, they're, you know, bouncing back and forth off the, the mountains and they're speeding up and they're already dried out. And we're already, this, you know, we see these a lot in the fall and toward the end of the uh, uh, summer when we're already pretty dried out. And this is why they're so bad for fire, right? Because as they flow down into LA and, and the, the areas, you know, down from us, they they can accelerate fires that are already going. They blow fire quickly and they're not, they're not, there's no moisture in there, so it's not helping to put out anything. So it makes it much worse. And this is a great satellite image here. I mean great that it shows you stuff. It's awful because the world's on fire. Um, but what we're looking at, in fact, look at this. There's our little there's a little notch. That's us right in there. Right? So these are the Tehachapis, which are really part of the the Sierra Nevada right there. We've got our San Gabriels right here. This is us. Everything south of us here 
is on fire because California, right? And there's that damn low pressure system uh, right down there that's pulling these Santa Ana winds down toward it, right? So you can see everything that's taking place. So again, we got the Chinooks, we got the Santa Anas. They're all unfortunate. Look, the only way we're getting rid of them, tear down the mountains. That's our one and only real option here. So, you know, start a GoFundMe or whatever if you want to do that, or we just learn to deal, which is what I'm trying to do. All right, folks, there's the wind stuff. Next time, we're going to get into climate regions, and we're going to get a sense of, I say modern day, meaning that we're going to be looking at what climate should be like, or these different climates should be like. And then we'll, we'll set that up, and then we can get into climate change and see how some of the stuff is dramatically changing and why that is. All right, so we're going to look at places. Like, look at it. My God, look at this picture. You see that water? Desert people. Have you ever seen that much water at once? Yeah, it happens. There are other parts of this country where they, they have water and trees and stuff like that. And it's all because of climate. And it's all because of stuff like the ITCZ and the subtropical high pressure. Blah, 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 all this stuff. So we'll get into like what this stuff actually does for the world. All right? All right. Have a lovely day or night or whatever. And I'll talk to you guys later.